Morning folks, and the truck Davy and the truck. Coming to you today from Motherwell. Well it's overcast. Um it's dry at the moment and it's 13 degrees. Um Right. For those of you who haven't watched the Monday show before, on the Monday I review the weekend. Say sort of Friday evening through to Sunday evening. Um as as as, as you know, my uh, shows always reporting on the day from uh, the news from the day before because I don't watch live TV, so I accumulate the stories when I got home at night, and I broadcast the stories the following day. Okay, so we'll start the show today with the coronavirus update. Um, the figures I'm about to give you are for yesterday, the 17th to the 5th, 20. Um, and that, Meryl I say, brings us up to date from when we went off, well, when I stopped broadcasting on Friday to now. Okay. Alright then, coronavirus update. Tested in Scotland. Mind these are accumulative figures. 87,660, and that's a plus 2,056 from the Saturday. So, basically 2,056 people were tested on Sunday. Um, those tested positive so far, as I say, there's an accumulative figure, is a 14,537, and that's up by 90. Um, from the Saturday, it's up, it's up 90. Active cases, 1,908, and that's doing 77 from the Saturday. So the figure's uh, steadily coming down, so that, um, those active cases are the amount of people in hospital and intensive care units or on coronavirus coronavirus wards and recovering at home. So the actual figure has a um, day on day, week on week uh, started coming down. So the pressure on the NHS isn't going to be as great. No. Deaths from this infection, this virus, 2,103. Now, that's up 96 for the figure I gave you on Friday. But um, expect the figure to get higher uh, tomorrow and again on Wednesday as um, deaths at the weekend start to get properly registered and the figures start to catch up with each other. Um, so, but when we look at it, um, the figures are coming down. They're consistently coming down, that's a good thing. It means we're getting on top of this. Still a bit early for people to rush out the door, but we're getting on top of this. Okay, so let's move on to the review of the weekend. I've picked a couple of stories from Friday, a few stories for Saturday, and a few stories for Sunday. We'll move on. Okay, so Friday. NHS labs frozen out of coronavirus testing. Aye, you hear us, right? President of the body for biomedical science states that the government set up the lighthouse labs across the UK without looking at what was already there within the NHS. So basically they outsourced it. Right. Alan Williams, who is the president of the Institute of Biomedical Science, um, says that the NHS had 130 labs that weren't even looked at that could have done this work. It could have been done in-house. And what he's saying is, yeah, the lighthouse uh, labs would have been an addition, would have been a welcome addition. But the testing regime should have been set up in these 130 NHS labs, and the 130 NHS labs should have been the, the um, foundation for the testing regime. Because they already existed, they already had scientists in them, and they could have been quickly converted to do these tests. But the NHS labs were frozen out, according to um, Alan Wilson, whose professional body represents a scientist that work in these 130 NHS labs. And what, what uh, this, this uh, Professor Wilson saying is the government never even approached his body to see if these NH labs, uh, NHS labs, who, which are already in existence and already fully staffed, could have done this work. 
the work went to the private sector instead of staying in-house. And we wonder why testing's taken so long to get uh, up and running. Because the UK government outsourced this uh, testing and Steady using 130 existed, uh, existing NHS labs. Outrageous behaviour. Also on Friday it was announced that Pretty Patel, the Home Secretary, after looking at the fees that the European uh, nurses and uh, nurses for, uh, for around the world and uh, um, workers that come to the UK for Europe and around the world under because we've left the, the EU. She was looking to see if uh, it was necessary for them still to pay this, uh, what's called the health tax, right? Um, which is, at the moment, £400, but in October goes up to £624, right? Anyway, Patel announces that the NHS tax will stay for migrant workers, right? So if you're a nurse, for somewhere else in the world and you're working in the NHS, you will be taxed uh, £400 a year if you pay it before October and you, it'll be £624 a year after October. That's just what you're going to have to pay. But here's the kicker. Let's say that nurse has got a husband and two kids. Then they all have to pay it. Right? And they're a five-year visa. That could run to thousands and thousands of pounds, over £8,000 actually. That's a bloody disgrace. These people are working in our NHS and in our care homes looking after our relatives and they are being taxed to use the health service they work in. It's a bloody disgrace. So it is. So, they are the stories that I wanted to talk about on Friday. We'll move on to Saturday and okay. But that one especially, this health tax on migrant workers who come here, when they're already paying all the other taxes that the rest of are paying, is a bloody outrage. Right, Saturday, the papers and the press, the Stushy over the border, doing the, uh, doing, uh, the border in the north uh, in the Irish Sea goes on. Right, as the Unionist fraternity and the Belfast begin to realise that Westminster's chucked them under the bus, has allowed the EU to annex them, they're starting to get really bloody angry. Um, rightly so, of course, because their whole doctrine is the union. You know, that's a unionist doctrine. Keep the union, be part of the union, be proud of the union, all the rest of the crap that goes with it, as well as the big drums and the silly wee sasses and things like that, um, and the paramilitary uniforms. But apart from that, you know... The reality that they are being a, um, ostracised and annexed and it's being allowed for a so-called unionist government in Westminster has got these people raging and it could be dangerous. What's interesting there though is unionists in Scotland are strangely quiet about this one. I mean, I watched the Mankey Jacob, the Man Mankey Jacob man's video at the weekend there. Alistair's for a, I can't even mind what he calls his organisation. But anyway, the daft day was putting out a video at the weekend, so I thought I'd watch it. Because, hey, Alistair's a nutter, but <laughs> hey-ho. But, hey, I watched that. Not a mention of the fact that Northern Ireland's been annexed. Nothing. Nothing. This is a guy that worked for the Orange Order here in Scotland. This is a guy who's a lunatic unionist. Runs about with a manky union Jack Jacob on. Or shut. But no, his a 35 minute video, I think it was 35, maybe a wee bit longer, um, at the weekend there, didn't they mention the fact that his unionist brothers and sisters in Northern Ireland had been thrown under a bus and been annexed? So the Stussy Uri, um, the, the situation in Northern Ireland is just getting started. Let's hope it doesn't get violent because, um, British nationalists have known to go uh, to turn to violence readily, very readily. Right, also on Saturday, the Agriculture Bill um, and its consequences start to sink in to the agricultural sector here in Scotland. And the farmers are not chuffed. They are bloody well raging, and rightly so. So they have gone hunting for the six Tory MPs. Good luck with that, farmers, because they've got a track record of being able, being able to disappear. You'll maybe have to go to London to get your paws on them.
down to their second homes. But you can bet your boots that these six Tory MPs are going to be hiding for the farmers. Hey. Right, the London Economic uh, reports that the UK government's new slogan, Stay Alert, Control the Virus and Save Lives, was deliberately, mis uh, was deliberately confusing in order to um, transfer the blame for any second wave from Westminster to the public. Because remember, this uh, um, Stay Alert message also came with Stay Home, Go to Work, Don't Use Public Transport, Go to Work, Stay Home. It's deliberately designed to confuse people. And then when the second wave hits, according to the London Economic, um, the government will be able to say, well, we tell you to stay at home. We tell you not to use public transport. So that's why this say, uh, stay alert, control the virus and save lives is deliberately misleading so that the government in Westminster can wriggle out all the blame for any second wave that's going to happen. And looking at a, um, the press over the weekend and the, the, the English people ignoring lockdown, going to the beauty spots and heading to beaches and things like that. And then, of course, the, there was a, the anti-lockdown protests, but we'll get to that. Um, a, then a second wave is coming. These people down there have taken it that the gloves are off, uh, the lockdown's finished, and they can go about doing what they want. And that's exactly what they've done. Especially with, with Boris's uh, misleading um, uh, information to them about being able to go and travel. You know, I mean, that means that they're going to jump in their caravans and motorhomes and head for beauty spots and, and small towns and villages which are already which would, uh, in, in the countryside, which, which were basically isolated for this bloody thing. Because this virus is mainly breaking out in care homes and in major population centres. But Boris opening the doors for people to travel means that this uh, virus is going to start making it into communities it should never have made it into. Bloody irresponsible. But that's the whole point of this stupid new slogan, stay alert, control the virus, save lives, is so that the public take the blame for when the second wave hits and know the government. <coughs> Moving on. A SMP to include universal basic income in any route map for future independence referendum. So in the prospectus that they're going to put forward for the next independence referendum, they're going to include universal, uh, universal basic in income for all citizens. And that will do away with anybody falling through the cracks and things like that if, if we ever have a pandemic or anything like that again. And uh, I was listening to Joanne Cherry at the weekend when they, they were talking about how would Scotland afford this um, if it wasn't for the broad shoulders of uh, the UK government. Well, it's quite simple. Uh, we get to, uh, it's been made clear that the furlough here is going to cost £3.75 billion. We give them £64 billion, they give us back £31. You keep a £64 billion, then you can more than afford it. You have a central bank of your own, then you can borrow um, because that's how other nations in the world, that's how Westminster's paying for it. It's borrowing. And guess what? Scotland's got a better credit, Scotland's got a better credit rating than, than, than the UK as a whole. I spoke about this, I spoke about this before. 2014. On the run up to the, uh, Scottish independence referendum. Every single, a uh, credit rating worldwide. Standards and Pure, Moody's, the lot, they all give Scotland a triple A plus credit rating. Right now, England's on a single A and heading for, or the UK's on a single A and the debt's heading for junk status. So of course Scotland could more than afford to cover this. Same with a banking crisis. Scott, they said that we couldn't afford to cover a banking crisis, but they did they tell the people out there that we only had to pay for what we recovered in the operations in our country. Most of those big banks, including the Royal Bank of Scotland's operations, are out with Scotland. So we would only had to pay for the, the share of their operations, which was in Scotland. So actually, the banking crisis would have cost us buttons. And as I say, we already give down to Westminster more than enough money to cover this crisis. 
In fact, we could have doubled the amount of money we put into it. And nobody needed to fall through the cracks. Because if we'd have been an independent country, we would have our universal basic income and nobody would have failed it through the cracks. Now, we would have just have shut the economy down and opened it back up. There would be nothing wrong with the economy. We just opened it back up and things would have taken a wee while, but there would be nothing running and everything would have been good again. But because we're still part of the UK, when the rest of the world is getting their economies up and running, because they've just paused them, the UK is going to hit Brexit and there's going to be no trade deals with anybody around the world. So, bugger, I mean, a mass unemployment, starvation, poverty, it's all coming down the track towards us. Isn't that wonderful? That's what happens when you're part of a, a union, like the UK union, where you don't have any voice and you don't have any say and you don't have any control. Right, that idiot Alistair Jack, um, on Saturday, wrote an article in the Telegraph to say that the SNP are using this time to port the breakup of the union. Do, Alistair, you're definitely not a rocket scientist. The resin detra of the SNP is to gain Scottish independence and break up the union, you half wit. Who gave this guy the call of inches to write this rubbish? I have absolutely no... Oh, I had a telegraph did, of course. But I don't know why the editor thought that was of any, any bloody importance or of any... I mean, everybody in the UK knows the SNP's policy is independence for Scotland. It didn't need to be filling up column inches. But, I mean, it just shows you the mentality of these half-wits. Eh? Don't hear him screaming about his union as buddies out in Northern Ireland are getting thrown under a bus. By his party... But he's got column inches in the Tory graph telling us all that he, the SNP are trying to break up the UK. That's not a bloody news flash. It's not even news. Right, Hancock hints at a pay freeze for nurses. We're in the middle of a bloody epidemic stroke pandemic. These people are dying. They're putting their lives on the line. They're working, in, they're working 12 hour shifts. They're knackered. And these Tories are going to freeze their wages for the next two years. Minimum. To pay for the COVID-19 outbreak. The poorest always bear the burden. So they do. And now, uh, public services, there's going to be another public service wage freeze. And uh, there might even be hyperinflation once we get a Brexit cut. Um, so we could be in, well, big trouble. And of course, the vultures are already um, circling to pick out the bones of what's left of the UK um, after Brexit. The Americans especially, as I reported on Friday, they want to veto our other trade deals with other nations. So out of the UK, out of the EU to get control one week into negotiations with the Americans and they've lost control of the Americans. But we have to remember that Boris Johnson is an American. Right, Cosler and local authorities in Scotland have agreed to open up the recycle centres, the household recycle centres eh, on the 1st of June if safe working practices can be put in place. That's good news because we're all starting to get junk bailing up into our gardens here because we can't get rid of it. Um, right, on to the anti-lockdown protests that were going on in Scotland this, eh, this weekend. Allegedly we're going on in Scotland this weekend. Um, turns out only 100 people showed up, less than 100 people showed up um, in all the major cities where these things were supposed to take part. So I'm not talking about less than 100 in each city, I'm talking about less than 100 across the whole of Scotland. Right? Glasgow, there was about 30 protesters. Edinburgh, there was 15. Inverness, they counted 10. And Dundee, there was 3. Aberdeen, there wasn't any. <laughs> so there you go, 45, 55, 58 protesters out to protest the lockdown in Scotland this weekend with these right-wing nut nutters. Alright, now let's move on to Sunday because time's, time's moving on. Civil war breaks out in England as the mayors of the largest northern cities tell residents and businesses to ignore Westminster and stay at home. Liverpool, Hartlepool, eh, Newcastle, Manchester. Just tell me, eh, Westminster, we're not opening our schools and we're not, uh, we're, not, we're not adopting your new message. So Liverpool, their time we stay at home. Help uh, protect the NHS, save, save, lives, uh, save lives. Manchester, the same. Um, um, Hartlepool, Newcastle and Gateshead, the same. And they're all refusing to reopen their schools on the 1st of June. So, civil wars broken out in, North, uh, in England between the North and the South. 
So this should be funny. You will see that, uh, uh, of course, uh, there will be retaliation taken in these cities. You'll find this, that these cities will get the funding cut. No doubt about it. Rusi Sunak confirms on Sunday that it doesn't matter what stage the regions and nations of the UK is at. When he decides that he furloughs Stokes, it's Stokes for everybody. So we know that Westminster's gone at the pace of um, the South East England, which was the first to get it, and they're in front of the rest of us. Um, but when the South East England, he's decided that, he's decided that when, when the South East England's ready to uh, um, come out of lockdown completely, the furlough scheme will stop for everybody. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. We'll see how that goes down We the cities in the north. The cities in the north are already eating on them because they're behind the curve. They're behind the curve. The same as Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. We got our cases a lot later and the North England got their cases a lot later. So, as I say, Sunak has just thrown fire, petrol in the fire that's already started to burn down there between the north and the south. Okay. Also on Sunday, it's revealed that opposition MPs... Oh, Christ. On Sunday, it's also revealed that opposition MPs have written to the EU asking for an extension, or asking for a Brexit extension. It won't make the blind bit of difference, because the Tories have a majority in the Westminster Parliament, so the uh, opposition MPs can send their letters to the EU as a form of protest in the EU, you can take note of it, but there's absolutely nothing opposition uh, MPs can do about it, because the people in England voted in a Tory majority. So the people of England are going to make the rest of us suffer. But that's just the way it goes. Right, it also emerges on Sunday the outcome of the 1920 Bojo gone in front of the 1922 committee. Apparently, there are a... Um, the Zoom conference with 120 people didn't work, so Boris got off light. Um, he was tell stop running the COVID-19 or the epidemic as if it's a campaign and get the country open back up. But you got to ignore most of what they were saying because apparently on Zoom there was animals in the background barking in their, country, in their big stately homes, there was children running about. There was all sorts going on, so nobody could actually make any sense of what we said. So Bojo got half light. Um, I don't think he'll continue getting half light, but as I say, the message, the message for the 1922 committee was dead simple. This isn't a bloody campaign. Get a grip of this COVID-19 situation and get the economy opened up. That was the message for them. Right, this week Nicola Sturgeon will outline a, the route map out of lockdown. And she'll probably... Um, Tinker at the edges of it, if you like, with things like the uh, golf courses and tennis courses and uh, and tennis um, tennis clubs and things like that being open back up. Sports, you know, exercise, that sort of thing. I don't think she'll do much tinkering. I don't think she'll do much tinkering with it. But as I say, the roadmap will be laid out, and they'll be able to get on with it and get it done. Oh, and uh, obviously on that road map there'll be markers that have to be passed before we move from one stage to the next. It's a sensible way to do it. Um, and I'd like to see her open up sectors at a time. Probably construction first. Um, and the uh, outdoor jobs like uh, garden set, uh, gardeners, um, windy cleaners, that sort of thing. That can work by themselves and uh, work safely. So I'd like to see things open up sector by sector and slowly. And I'm sure the First Minister will do what's right for Scotland. I'm 100% sure. In fact, we're very, very, very lucky here. Even unionists here feel lucky that we've got Nicola in charge. Um, as the polls have been shown. So that's uh, the roundup of the weekend. Um, obviously there's some news this morning, but I'm not going to touch that anymore because I say my show... Um, as always, uh, reflecting on the news of the day before. All right. So that's it. That's the review of the weekend. I hope you found some of these stories interesting. Um, the most interesting one for me was how they ignored 130 NHS labs 
and privatise the, the COVID-19 testing regime. Bloody madness. And it set it back a long way, and it means that people, um, <laughs> people have died. 130 NHS labs, and they didn't even look at them. Nuts. Absolutely nuts. I don't know how many of the labs are in Scotland, Northern Ireland, or Wales, or whether 130 of them are in England, because they always equate uh, the UK with England. They don't, they don't even think about the rest of us. But that's the story that caught my eye. I hope you found that interesting. So as I say, that's it. I'll speak to you all tomorrow. Indy Truck Davy in the truck, coming to you from Motherwell, where it's starting to clear up. And it's 14 degrees. Have a nice day.